Hello, everyone, uh, and uh, welcome to our tutorial, how to achieve both transparency and accuracy in predictive decision making, an introduction to strategic prediction. Uh, I'm Harap Alimata, uh, and together with Ben Edelman and Yo Shavit, we will be presenting this uh, tutorial. Uh, and we're all PhD students from Harvard. Very important information. Uh, so just for the uh, tutorial outline, to give you an idea about the topics that we are going to be discussing today, uh, in the first part, I'm going to be introducing what exactly is uh, strategic decision making, because the title that we have is uh, pretty long and fancy, uh, who are the key actors that are involved, and then I would co conclude by talking about the kind of oldest uh, research strand that uh, CS uh, scientists have taken, which is the robustness perspective. Uh, then we're going to break for uh, Q&A, and then Yo will talk about um, the fairness and recourse perspective in strategic prediction. Then again, we're going to break for Q&A. And then finally, Ben uh, will talk to us about the causality perspective in strategic prediction. And then we will have more time for Q&A. So allow me to start. Um, I think that most of you in this audience, if not all of you, uh, know that machine learning algorithms are being used increasingly uh, in order to make consequential decisions for our everyday lives. Um, as an example, it might be the case that an algorithm decides whether you qualify for the new loan or not for which you are applying, or whether we qualify for probation or not, whether we will be admitted to the school of our choice, or whether we will be finally invited for this in-person interview in the company of our dreams. And because of the fact that um, these decisions are so consequential and important for our lives, people have started uh, strategizing in order to obtain better outcomes from these algorithms. As an example, one might try to increase the number of credit cards that they have uh, or the number of bank accounts that they have or to improve their credit history as an effort to uh, get approved for the loan that they uh, applied for. Uh, students may try to improve their GPA, retake the GRE, or even pay for tutoring classes um, in order to improve their grades, uh, or they can even change schools in order to alter uh, their in-class ranking. Um, people may dress a certain way, they may hide piercings or tattoos, uh, or they may change the way they talk in order for uh, the software to classify them as good candidates for an in-person interview. And before uh, I tell you why this strategizing um, basically, quote unquote, destroys standard machine learning algorithms, uh, I'd like to remind everyone in this audience today, uh, why did we start using machine learning algorithms or automated decision making in the first place? Now, the reason, according to uh, what I believe, is that, it, first of all, we have an abundance of people's data nowadays, and this is something that we will not be focusing on uh, for this tutorial. But the second reason is the very heart of the machine learning paradigm. Uh, and at the, the heart of the machine learning paradigm, I define this translation uh, that says that if you see patterns in some training or past data that you have, you can use these patterns because they are the same or pretty similar for the test or the future data that you have. And just to give you um, a pictorial representation of what this process looks like from the standard uh, ML lens and from a more quote unquote technical perspective. Um, if we want to see how a bunch of features correlates with a true outcome for something, um, where features can represent um, someone's age, the education level, the zip code that they have, the number of credit cards, the number of bank accounts, you can see features are basically all the characteristics that you can come up with and you think that they correlate with the true outcome. And what is the true outcome? Examples include the current credit score, the loan or mortgage qualification, or in general, your credit worthiness if we talk about uh, such settings. Then um, basically what we see is that if um, in the particular example that I have here on the slide, if we're trying to see how the number of credit cards correlates with the credit worthiness that you have. If you have a bunch of examples that show to you, oh, if you have like three credit, a person with three credit cards had like credit worthiness 500, then you can fit a rule that is learned from the training data 
And based on the standard primitive for machine learning, if one were to reveal to you uh, all the data, all the data that you would ever apply this rule to, then the rule that you learn, which is the green rule, is close to the optimal that you could have applied had you known all the data, even the blue ones. Okay. Now, why is this not enough when we are talking about strategic agents? Well, the reason is the following. Uh, an agent who knows, these agents here, for example, who know that uh, the, this, the particular decision rule that we have favors uh, more credit cards in order to predict a, a, a higher credit worthiness, they would probably try to misreport to something like that. So they would try to increase the number of credit cards that they have. And this basically means that we cannot use the original rule that we had, the green rule, because the data now corresponds to individuals who have agency and they want to um, alter the decisions uh, which are made by them, by the machine learning algorithms. This is the strategizing uh, that I talked about in the very first slide with all these examples. And now, uh, what is the consequence uh, for standard machine learning algorithms? Well, for one, for decision makers, um, we cannot trust the green rules anymore. Uh, they were created based on data that does not take the agency of the people into account. Um, so what should we do? Well, uh, the, the recent field of strategic prediction advocates that what you should do is you should be taking these incentives into account, the agency of individuals into account, and basically create rules that um, incorporate the knowledge of the data's uh, strategic response. And I'd like to uh, pause for a second and say at this point that um, this is not something that uh, has just appeared uh, right now. Uh, this is already known in the uh, fields of economics and public policy under different names, um, the Goodhart's Law or Campbell's Law and many other names. Uh, and at a, at a very high level, uh, these, these laws say that uh, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to become a good measure. Uh, just to see an example where this can be applied in our machine learning driven motivation, uh, think about a school whose admissions rule is very simple and straightforward, and it's the following. It says that you will be admitted to this school if you have more than 100 books uh, in your house. Now, this rule um, has the following uh, background, quote unquote. This rule says that if you have a lot of books at your house, then you must have read them, then you must be a very well-versed person, then you can be admitted to our school. But if this rule gets revealed to the students or the prospective students, prospective students with say 90 or more books can easily buy like 10 or 20 more books, but they need not uh, read, need not, but they need not read them. So they just get admitted just because of their strategizing of buying 10 or so more books. And so this defeats the purpose of having the books as the main measure of qualifications. And of course, this is a toy example, but uh, it just serves to uh, give you the idea of like, what is the problem when we are having strategizing agents? And when we're talking about strategic prediction, there are three key actors that are uh, involved in this uh, power sharing scheme, kind of like, and there are, uh, uh, there are trade-offs that these have to suffer. So on the one hand, uh, we have the institution. Uh, the institution uh, are basically mechanism or algorithm designers. Their goal is to model um, accurately the future, something that they will be doing for profit or for justice. And their leverage is to alter the decision-making algorithms however they deem fit. As an example, um, if you are a bank, then you are the institution. Uh, you want to create algorithms for loan improvement that can accurately give you the highest profit, even being robust to the strategizing behavior, the potential strategizing behavior of the individuals that come applying for the loans. Now, what is your leverage? The, your leverage is to look at prior data, historical data that you have from your bank or whatnot, and 
identify the patterns, however you seem fit, in order to uh, create your quote unquote good or robust algorithms. Now, the second actor uh, is the individual per se. Individuals are the data providers, the persons that supply the institutions with data. Um, our goal as individuals is to always obtain the best predictions uh, for ourselves. And our leverage is to alter our data uh, within our power. Now, in the previous example with like uh, the bank and the loan mechanism, uh, individuals are applicants for these loans. Uh, what is their goal? Uh, their goal is to, when applying, when submitting their characteristics, their folder for uh, uh, consideration for the loan, they want to always be granted the loan. That's what the best prediction uh, looks like. And what can they do? They can change part of their data, uh, but to a limited amount. For example, you can increase the number of credit cards that you have, but only so much, because afterwards it will start hurting your credit score. Uh, or you can increase the number of bank accounts that you have, uh, or you can um, help your savings account or your credit history somehow. Uh, but again, remember that this within their power thing is defined by constraints that uh, uh, dictate how much you can move, basically, how much you can change stuff. And the third doctor is society. Uh, society basically are all people as a whole. Our goal is to achieve uh, fairness, robustness against bad actors and genuine improvement. And our leverage is to regulate, create norms and expectations and also public pressure. Now, in the previous example with the bank and the person that is applying for a loan, um, the, the, it's, the, the robustness to bad actors means that uh, no person, we wouldn't want as a society a person to try to quote unquote fool the bank, uh, like lie and gain something out of it. Um, that's what we mean by robustness to bad actors. Uh, but we also want uh, genuine improvement, meaning we want to help the individuals who are applying for loans actually become better as a result uh, of their efforts to be, uh, uh, to be qualified, judged as qualified by this algorithm. So. As an example, uh, it's good for someone to pay back, to pay off all their previous loans if that's what they think will help them get, uh, get this next loan that they are applying for. This is what we mean by uh, genuine improvement. And the trade-off that exists in this uh, uh, triangle, actually power triangle, is between transparency and accuracy. Now the institution on the one hand um, wants above all things, accuracy, robustness to uh, people that are strategizing with their data uh, and they want to learn decision rules that grant them the highest profits no matter what. That's their topmost goal. I'm not saying it's the only goal, it's their topmost goal. Uh, on the other hand, individuals and society, we want transparency for many reasons. We want to be able to probe the algorithms that decide our lives. Uh, we want to be able to uh, ask and get feedback about how we could improve our applications. Um, and also transparency can lead to uh, a lot of social good, like fairness. So th there's a subtlety here. Um, the reason why th th there is this trade-off of transparency versus accuracy is really because the individuals are going to act upon the decisions of the institution. If the individuals were to be kind of like static entities and their data were to be characteristics that uh, do not change whatsoever, uh, then even if you have like transparency, that will not, that doesn't like contradict with the principles, with the institution's accuracy. Okay. And uh, moving on uh, for the remainder of my time, I will be taking the viewpoint of the institution. I will be talking about how computer scientists uh, have thought about modeling uh, the, the objective of the institution as modeling robustness or accuracy and robustness against strategic agents in computer science. So, um, so the modeling it goes as follows. 
Uh, there are these two actors that are involved for now, only the institution and the individual. The individual uh, measures their net gains. This is what I called their leverage in the previous slide in terms of a utility function. Now, utility functions are a notion that we borrow from the economics literature and basically uh, are encode, encode the difference between the value that we get for obtaining an outcome A minus the cost that we have to pay. This cost can be um, something in terms of money, uh, effort, time that we spend in order to obtain this outcome A. Now, the institution, the other actor that's playing in this quote unquote game, has some prior information about the individual's utility function. Um, what does this prior information look like? Well, it can take two forms. Uh, either we assume that the institution has full knowledge of the individual's utility, or they have only partial knowledge of the individual's utility. Now, why would you ever assume that they can have full knowledge? Well, you can have super reliable market research, and you think that this is almost identical. This is almost exactly how they how they behaved historically. On the other hand, if you have, if you're not quite certain, there's some uncertainty, and you don't want to risk it, then you assume that the um, institution has only partial. Uh, knowledge of the utility function. And just to give you an idea about how this looks like, um, how this would look like uh, encoded um, in terms of like uh, payoff matrices, for those of you who are familiar with this, basically such a setting would tell you that when the utility function is fully known, then uh, if you assume that the principal has only two policies that they can deploy, uh, this is policy one and this uh, is policy two, and uh, the individual has only two actions that they can take. These actions correspond to the two different data sets that the individual can report. Then uh, full knowledge of the utility function means that the, the institution for every policy possible can identify the, um, the payoff that they get or the, 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 the loss actually in accuracy um, compared to the action that the principal, compared to the action that the individual takes as a result of their uh, utility, this, their specific utility function. And on the other hand, let me just move this here so that I can yes scroll. Um, so on, on the other hand, uh, when we're talking about only partially known utility functions, the payoff matrices look something like this. Again, you have the two policies, policy one and two. But for the actions of the uh, individual, you only have uh, limited knowledge. So you have no knowledge here. Uh, you know that this is somewhere in the range less than three or above zero, but nothing more than that. So in these two scenarios, uh, with full and partial uh, knowledge of the utility, uh, what is the robustness measure that computer scientists have been using? Uh, on the one hand, uh, we have uh, the equilibrium rule. Uh, the equilibrium rule says that uh, the decision rule that the institution is going to deploy is the most accurate one if you take into account the, the agent's utility, the fact that the agents respond according to their utility. So in this example with the payoff matrix that I had here, um, this corresponds to policy one, because no matter what action the agent takes, uh, it's always, the loss is always one, while in the other case, it's more than that. Uh, on the other hand, when we don't have full knowledge of the utility function, um, we strive for identifying a no regret rule, uh, which is a rule that in hindsight achieves similar results to the best possible policy or rule had you known everything that is that pertains to the agent's utility function in advance. Uh, which is not something that you actually have in the in this model here. And there have been a lot of works. Uh, oh, and here, this policy one is also, again, the policy that achieves this uh, no regret rule. So there have been uh, a lot of works in this area. Uh, most importantly, uh, the work by Hard, Megiddo, Papa Dimitri and Wooders from ITCS 2016. Uh, this is the paper that actually introduced a strategic uh, classification as a, uh, as a setting, and it talks about uh, equilibrium rules. 
Uh, and there have been a number of papers, namely the Dong, Roth, Schutzman, Wagoner, Wu, EC uh, 2018 paper, my paper with Yiling Chen and Yang Liu from NURIPS 2020, and the paper by Ahmadi, Behagi, Blum, and Nagida, which was recently posted on Archive. Uh, and they talk about identifying no regret rules. So basically this area so far has focused on constructing algorithms, constructing mechanisms from the perspective of the institution under different assumptions on the utility functions of the models. And this is actually what differentiates all these papers. Uh, the assumptions on the utility functions uh, that uh, these papers assume about the power of the individuals to this report. And with that, I'd like to conclude my part and open up for uh, questions. Okay, thank you, Hara. So why don't we go to the questions that are already on Slido and um, mm -hmm. maybe I can read them to you and then we can read them aloud and then we can answer one by one. Mm -hmm. um, so we have one question, uh, which is, can adding more data from underrepresented groups help improve accuracy in strategic predictions? At, what, at which point in providing additional diverse data um, is this detrimental to the model's accuracy? Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a wonderful question. Um, I'd like to say at this point that, um, so, okay. Uh, I'll be uh, blunt. I will answer this question only partially because it's mostly in the part that uh, Yo will talk to us about in the next uh, part of the tutorial, but I'll say the following. Uh, when you add more data from the underrepresented groups, uh, the institution, I'm not sure if they care an awful lot. Uh, but what happens is that as the paper, some papers that Yo is gonna uh, mention in the next part of the uh, tutorial, the problem becomes that you see that strategic prediction exacerbates uh, already existent uh, inequalities uh, between uh, disenfranchised and advantaged groups. And there have been uh, two, at least two papers that I know of uh, that appeared in uh, this conference in 20, either 2018 or 2019, I don't remember exactly. And they basically measure this exactly like the cost, how different the costs for movement are uh, when you have groups that are uh, disadvantaged versus groups that are uh, advantaged. And the principal is engaging in a strategic classification game. Um, this is, so first of all, do we assume that only individuals could be bad actors? Can the institution also be systemically, uh, systematically discriminating? Well, I guess I'll ask that first and then we'll go to the next part of the question afterwards. Uh, definitely. Uh, there are, okay, so there, there are two parts in my answer here. I have been uh, on purpose, um, kind of like alluding to individuals as bad actors so far and taking the robotness perspective. But that's an excellent question because individuals are not always bad actors. And in fact, when we're talking about two of the examples that I uh, touched upon during this talk, one was the school example and the other one was the uh, loan example. Sometimes strategic behavior is good. It can help people become better. There's genuine improvement that you can achieve. And so they're not always bad actors. And this is something that uh, you, Ben, you're gonna talk about this in your yep. uh, third part. And the other part of this answer is that this is an excellent question. So far, people haven't assumed explicitly that the um, institution is a bad actor but they have definitely, but the fact that all this literature, kind of like with the principal not caring about the accuracy, sorry, not caring about other things apart from accuracy, takes the perspective of an institution that doesn't care about actually shifting uh, like people's credit worthiness, kind of like, or th that doesn't care about genuinely helping people that much. There have been different work that deal with that and uh, Ben is also going to talk to us about this. Great. Uh, so there's a second part to this question. 
uh, which was, do we consider collusion among individuals as part of an individual's leverage? Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, so far, technically, people haven't uh, thought about this, uh, but there are very negative results for the principal, even if the agents, the individuals are uh, independently utility maximizers. So yeah, I can, I can imagine that it only gets worse, but uh, there has not been done any work on accuracy and robustness and accuracy for groups colluding altogether. So um, just uh, so someone wrote just to this out asked if, if it's possible for us to share a link to the slides, and we replied with a link to the slides on slide do. So if you want to follow along or go back in the slides, you can click yeah. that link. Um, yeah. And so okay, we have uh, one more question, and um, yeah, we're, any more questions, we're encouraging them to come. Um, this question was: Do you know of any studies that look at how much gaming? occurs in practical ML applications? Oh, this is such an excellent question. Um, and um, I'm saying this in such despair because um, I kind of have been thinking for quite some time, how can we really measure this? Like we have anecdotal advice for all of these things. Uh, like we know that we have anecdotal advice of like people trying to manipulate scoring rules like that, or like change the credit score with like applying for more credit cards. And there's also a very famous example in, I, I want to say Hong Kong. So this is one of the examples that people go to for strategic, um, kind of like strategic manipulation in machine learning systems, where very briefly, what happened is that an insurance company said to Hong Kongers, um, send us all your data from your phone, from your health app. And if we see that you are walking or you are running a lot, you are doing treadmill, whatnot, then you will qualify for a better insurance premium. And of course, uh, what, what people did is they created these office cradles where you can actually go Google this. It's a pretty well known example. Uh, they created these office cradles that you put your phone in, you're just in your office sitting, and then the phone goes like that. And it looks at, and the health app actually registered you running for kilometers. So like, that's another anecdotal advice of like a machine learning rule that was learned from past data of like, oh, this is what like, if people are exercising more then they should qualify for an insurance premium and they, uh, and people end up, ended up gaming it. But I'm not sure I'm aware of any study that gives us the exact quantity of uh, strategicness. And it's not the problem to me, just like one more bit. The problem to me at least is that I don't know what to take as baseline. Like when I see people's data, I don't know whether this is the data that comes after manipul after like strategizing or some actors were not thinking about strategizing at all. Like you have very few examples where you can know that exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I'll just jump in a little more on that. First of all, um, uh, uh, I'm excited to see more people do this. Um, uh, I certainly, I, I, have, uh, I have been trying and Burke, you asked the question, I hope you've been trying to. Um, uh, and uh, I, one thing I will say is that I certainly have lots of friends in industry who concretely tell me that this is happening to them and they are dealing with this. And so our friends out there in industry, if you would like to publish some information to inform the research community, that we would love that. Um, uh, and then maybe the last thing is that the economics literature has studied this quite a bit and they have lots of examples in which this concretely occurs. One, uh, one paper I can suggest is, uh, is Camacho and Conover uh, had a paper in 2011 where you can very clearly see the moment that the the model became transparent, it began to be gamed. Um, uh, and yeah, yeah, but but I would say that right now we don't have any examples of this in the like classic machine learning context. And so I'm hoping that we will in the next few years. I guess, so just, okay, this question is really making me passionate. And Yo and I have actually discussed about that like at least two years before that I can remember that. So <laughs> there's another thing that's very hard here, which is, also a hardness that we know from economics. So economics is a wonderful science that's 
kind of like microeconomics at least, built around trying to model people's preferences. And we still do not have a single global universal model that we can all get behind and say, oh, this is how people take actions. This is exactly the utility that they use. We don't know that. And so this whole strategic prediction literature is built upon the premise that we have already solved this question. So I'm not sure how we can exactly quantify incentives if uh, we do not fix kind of like a particular utility model that we want to focus on. But that's a wonderful question. And I'd love to uh, chat more with anyone who's interested about it. Yeah, great. Um, maybe we have time for one more of the questions and then maybe we'll push uh, the remaining questions to the Q&A after Yo's portion of the, of the presentation. Um, so we have a question. Um, how do you think uh, about um, navigating the interest of the individual who may not want to share sensitive personal data or be validly skeptical of the institution and the need of a well-meaning institution to have that data to improve their prediction fairness? Yeah, so this is where uh, I guess strategic prediction will have to ask for help from uh, our differential privacy friends. Um, but I honestly don't know. There have been some works, I, uh, but they're not exactly on strategic prediction. They are on um, kind of like learning from revealed preferences where people, where the institution needs to actively pay somehow people in order to give out their data. And that they pay them and the data is kind of like protected. Uh, and there's a lot of work that has to do with like purchasing data and what are the correct incentives for institutions who are benevolent in the sense that they want to help people and they just want to create better decision-making rules. Um, but not, nobody has actually been able to do that in what we call strategic prediction so far. That's another excellent question. Yeah, what great questions. Um, great, why don't we- We're going to have a break here, but you know, these questions are sparking a lot of great conversation. So let's just move straight on to Yo's portion of the talk. Okay. Um, well, th uh, Hara, thank you for, for introducing the, the concept of strategic prediction and on sort of giving us the institution's perspective on it. Um, what I'm going to talk about in this portion is really the way that individuals are affected by this kind of uh, uh, this paradigm of having agents game a machine learning system and having the institution uh, aware that this gaming is occurring and potentially uh, 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 try and potentially how how it, their awareness affects the individuals as well. So um, first, let's focus on what these individuals actually want out of a decision, uh, out of this entire process. So the simplest answer is that they would like they would like recourse. They would like to get the best possible decision that they can get out of this prediction rule. So if we go back to the credit example. Um, an individual wants to get a loan. They want to have a good credit score. Um, everything else is just uh, on some level secondary. Like the, the whole reason that, that, that they would potentially change their features, that they would, for example, open more credit cards or pay off their debts or things like this. It might happen incidentally, but as it relates to these predictors, it's all about trying to get your prediction to be what you want it to be, to get it to be as good as possible. Um, another thing that they want though, is they want not to be uh, forced to do bad things or, uh, or dis disincentivized to do good things. Um, so for example, um, uh, an individual doesn't want to be told that they have to commit a crime uh, in order to get like a credit, in order to get, uh, get uh, um, a loan. And they don't want to have to be told that they need to, you know, um, reduce the, uh, the amount of, um, of books that they have in their house uh, in order to uh, in order to get into college or something like that. There are all sorts of, per of potentially uh, uh, weird things that a model might incentivize that individuals actually have a value on like whether they have to increase or decrease this. And we might have uh, uh, some external value on whether we want to encourage them to do these things. Um, the individuals might uh, certainly care about not expending resources in the process 
of the strategic behavior. Um, buying extra books to to cheat your way into college costs money. But also, like in on in the on, on the serious sense, um, if we tell everybody who uh, uh, to to open more credit cards, that has like real administrative like time and and financial costs. And we want to make sure that we're not making people pay too much. Um, and then finally, there's a matter of dignity. Uh, individuals want to uh, want to be able to achieve recourse regardless of their demographic group, regardless of attributes about them that are not relevant to the to the decision. Um, and, and like as a matter of, I mean, this is certainly an objective of the of the institution, but uh, or sorry of the of the society to not have these sort of systemic inequities. But it's also like a matter for the individual. Um, so. Uh, it, you might you might ask yourself, this is like a topic vaguely related to uh, to computer science ethics. Uh, I wonder whether a lawyer from the 70s has written something about this. And you would be correct. Barbara Underwood basically like said everything interesting there is to be said about this field um, uh, in, in 1979, her exceptional review, uh, Law in the Crystal Ball. And, you know, I'm not supposed to tell you this, but if you read through it, uh, you will have many of the, uh, or if not all of the arguments that we bring up here, um, really eloquently discussed in the context of the early uh, uh, the early literature on prediction rules that arose when banks first started lending based on rules instead of based on in-person interactions. Um, and she's actually very optimistic about the idea of making decisions based on features that people can manipulate. Uh, to quote her, the use of controllable factors provides an opportunity for the individual who really wants to be selected to choose conduct that improves his predictive score and hence his prospects for selection. Um, and the goal here is really agency. You are giving people back the ability to have some say over what happens to them as a result of these institutions making decisions. And that's in some sense a good thing. So um, let's let's focus on like what, what the computer science literature has actually brought to the table since a lot of these phenomena are things that like people know about intuitively. So first of all, we now have far too many machine learning predictors deployed in high consequence uh, settings for us to actually be able to individually scrutinize every single different predictor. And so we really need to come up with some systemic ways that we can ensure that this uh, strategic gaming behavior is both uh, uh, beneficial to individual, uh, beneficial to individuals, beneficial to institutions, and that like that we handle these things at scale rather than uh, case by case. Um, we are now moving into a scenario where uh, there are black box models, either because people are using like a legitimately black box model, like a neural network or something like that, or because they're using a linear regression with tons of parameters and they functionally don't really, like they never look at the actual weights that they have on every parameter and thus don't really know exactly what their model is incentivizing and the sorts of strategic behavior it'll encourage. Um, we, are, we are now working uh, uh, in these extremely high dimensional uh, spaces and so concepts like fairness and like uh, uh, and like accuracy and like gaming take on these like weird high dimensional uh, 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 um, meanings and so we need to have analogs for our sort of normative values that we can that we can quantify and in this vein um, a lot of these works are really helping us to put a number on these abstract quantities so that we can hope to plot the like the the Pareto frontier the set of sort of the best set of trade-offs between um, between multiple values, like for example, fairness and accuracy is a classic one. So that uh, like actual um, policymakers or institutions um, can, can make normative decisions about how much of one they care about relative to how much of another. So um, the, it's actually important to highlight here why, uh, why strategic prediction is kind of crucial for the concept of recourse. Um, people, up, I mean, it might seem separate. It might seem like, okay, we want people to get the best possible decision they can get. That's a separate question from asking how can the institution be accurate uh, against gaming individuals. So let, let's go through the, the 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 logic of it. So we want recourse. Now, the standard response to us wanting to to, to trying to give people more recourse is, well, let's just tell the institution to give everybody a, a positive decision, or you know, give everybody a positive decision if they take. The necessary actions, right? That that is how we maximize recourse. But then you have to ask yourself: if we're giving everybody a positive decision, then did we really need to use machine learning in the first place? Like, it, for example, if it's about healthcare, um, if we want, if we we sort of want to make sure to give everyone healthcare if they do something, um, uh, uh, would it like would it not just be better to to give it to them in the first place? Why do we need why do we need the concept of accuracy at all? 
if we're in a scarce setting, like for example, in hiring, where you're gonna hire some people and not hire other people, then you do actually need to have some notion of, of accuracy of like, uh, 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 I wanna hire some people, not others, but I still wanna give people agency in terms of getting themselves closer to the pool of people who are going to get hired. So um, if the institution wants accuracy, well, the default model today is they're just going to be secretive about their machine learning. They're not gonna tell anybody how it works. They're not gonna be transparent. And as a result, they're not gonna to need to worry as much about strategic behavior. They will need to worry some because people often figure out how these systems work. But more importantly, we aren't getting as much recourse because we don't know how the systems work. And like we're, we, we should be sad about that because it is an important value. So the benefit of strategic prediction is that it actually gives institutions a reason to care about, um, or a reason to make their model transparent enough that they will not receive harm from people gaming their system and will allow people to get recourse while maintaining accuracy for themselves. And so it's actually kind of a way of bridging this gap. Um, and and that, that's why we that's why individuals might want this us to explore this uh, this direction of research, which you know we would hope because we are also individuals. Um, but uh, uh, so now let's talk about some of the potential drawbacks that appear in more depth. So first of all, let, let's talk about um, Virginia Eubanks' uh, excellent book, Automating Inequality, about, um, about basically the way that algorithms have uh, entrenched and systematized various, uh, uh, various aspects of poverty in our society. So one of the examples that she brings up is this, uh, this uh, example from Allegheny County of a, um, a predictor that they've created to try and predict whether children are likely to, um, to be, be, uh, be maltreated in their um, their uh, uh, in their homes, and this is an extremely serious problem from the perspective of the parents who really, really don't want their kids taken away, and from the perspective of the the state, which is which really, really does not want children to be abused in their homes. Um, and so these decisions are very serious. Um, and I just want to walk you through a potential thing that could happen in this situation. Now, I know that these folks work with the fact community a lot, and so I trust that they are being more responsible than this, but it's a, it's a worryingly plausible story. So um, one of the large criticisms that Eubanks has about a lot of these public sector algorithms is that they tend to use public, uh, public sector data. Like for example, the use of welfare programs like the Supplemental Nutrition, Nutrition for uh, uh, Assistance program for, for, for poor families. Now, um, now one, one uh, unfortunate truth is that our perceptions of child maltreatment um, in our society correlate with poverty. And, uh, and the use of SNAP benefits correlates with, um, with poverty as well. And so it's entirely possible that like a correlative machine learning algorithm would learn that uh, the, the utilization of, of food aid, like SNAP benefits, um, is, is actually a good predictor or a reasonable predictor of whether uh, a child uh, is more likely to become maltreated. And it raises this awful specter of the potential of, um, of parents who want to prevent their children from being taken away from their home, um, potentially forgoing food aid out of fear that it, out of a justified fear that it will change their probabilities of being flagged by the predictive algorithm. So there are some things that we really want to make sure that we do not incentivize or that we, that we either don't incentivize more of or incentivize less of. Um, and one potential sort of guideline here is whenever you're putting features into your black box model, just think to yourself, not only is this going to help me be predictive, but also is this going to, it, am I comfortable with encouraging somebody to do more or less of this? Because if you're not, and you're making a consequential ba decision based on it, you're deluding yourself about whether they will or they won't. And it, it is really important to get this stuff right. Um, now, one interesting direction of work from the last few years is on the idea of, um, of how much effort people are putting in as a result of strategic decisions. So let's go back to the, 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 the sort of uh, uh, like college or, or let's say fellowship admission program idea. So the number of books is a, is a good predictor of whether you're likely to do really well at this fellowship or not. The green dots are doing really well and the red dots are not doing very well. And so you might imagine that initially the institution comes up with a predictor, uh, sorry, with, with, a, with, a, with a predictor, everyone on the right gets admitted and everyone on the left doesn't. Um, and the people as before who are close to the boundary are going to buy some more books um, in order to be able to have themselves classified as positive. Um, 
Now, the institution will notice this, and because they're being, they, they are aware of strategic agents, and so they are going to employ strategic prediction methods, they might move the boundary. Um, and uh, those folks who now would do well at the fellowship um, are currently being classified negatively. And so uh, they will go and buy some books and move themselves into the positive uh, re regime again. And so in some sense, you're still making a perfectly accurate decision. Everyone is classified according to like on the side that they should be. Um, but one thing you'll notice is that these, these, these orange arrows, like people have now spent a ton of money on books only to get exactly the same result. Um, and, uh, and so uh, a work by, by Millie, Miller, Dragon, and Hart um, from, from uh, this conference in 2018 um, really highlighted uh, the, the extent to which we are forcing everybody to pay costs for this, for this gaming if we want to still be accurate. And uh, in, in particular, the like really normatively problematic thing is we're forcing people who we think are qualified for this fellowship to pay greater costs just for us to acknowledge the decision that we would have anyway if the system had been totally obscure. And so this is a real trade-off um, uh, uh, that, that we're having to make here. Now, uh, another recent paper um, from Gupta Nukiz Roy and Venkata Subramanian um, uh, really focuses on the extent to which uh, um, strategic prediction type things uh, um, and, and, and mechanism, uh, sorry, and, and mechanisms um, have the potential for exacerbating uh, cross-group inequality. So if we look at the top example, there are two groups. There's the group at the top, it's here. Um, uh, I don't know if you can see that. Um, and uh, the one in the sort of red-ish shade and the group at the bottom in the bluish shade. And um, the group at the bottom is much farther on average from the prediction boundary than the group at the top. Now you can see in this case that there's like no loss to just changing the prediction boundary as we do in the bottom um, and having the groups be equally distant um, and thus need to expend equal resources in order to get to a positive decision. Now, um, one reason that this is so, so uh, problematic is that you can imagine that most people, if they are aware of these decisions, are going to take these actions. And so it is actually much more consequential. It is just as consequential, in fact, to make sure that you are you are allowing for for uh, equality and the ability inability to get recourse as it is to be fair in the first place in terms of the decisions that you were making if people weren't reacting because it's so almost certain that they will react. Um, and here it, this appears as distances in feature space, but you can just as easily imagine this happening um, where the groups have the same initial features, but some groups have. Uh, a very different ability to, to pay, let's say, and to, to expend lots of resources in moving, or the, the, the actions are much easier for them to take, and so you get these same effects. And, um, and so, in fact, what this group did was they proposed a machine learning uh, algorithm uh, uh, that satisfies essentially a constraint of uh, trying to, um, among other things, minimize the difference in the ease of, of, in the amount of recourse achievable by group A and group B. Um, and it's the sort of idea that should prompt you to think about, okay, what is my idea of the way that different demographic groups should potentially um, need to need, uh, be able to achieve recourse? And how do I get to some notion of, of justice in that domain? Now, there are lots and lots of interesting questions as far as like the individual's uh, uh, benefit within this sort of transparent strategic prediction regime. I'll mention just a few quickly. Um, but note that there are many more than I will cover. Um, so one question is, can subsidies help with cross-group recourse when some can pay more than others? And the really interesting finding is that sometimes they make everybody worse off, but also sometimes they, they, they make uh, everybody better. This is from a paper by, by Hu Morlicka and Wharton Vaughn from this conference in 2019, uh, actually, that shouldn't be 18. Um, uh, another question is, so, presumably there's some explanation of these systems going on. You can either make them transparent or instead um, you can make your predictor uh, sort of comprehensible by providing counterfactual explanations to people. And these counterfactual explanations will inevitably prompt individuals to game in specific directions. And so you can ask yourself, how do, do, does providing different counterfactual explana explanations um, change the, the, like, uh, uh, the individual benefit and how does it change the group accuracies? Um, Another interesting line of work is about what happens if decisions are randomized. For example, um, when teachers are constructing exams, they, uh, uh, they will often have many, many exam questions. And the students know it'll be one of these questions, but they don't know which specific one. And this causes them to have to study for everything at the same time. And you can imagine that very similar things occur when your decision is randomized. 
And so in some sense, this might prevent sort of harmful recourse in the case, of, sorry, harmful uh, gaming, as is in the case uh, of the teacher preventing students from like cheating by only studying on one question on the exam. But it, it introduces a whole bunch of interesting complications. And I strongly recommend you check out the work by Braverman and Gard uh, from last year that talks about this. And finally, a very recent paper by, uh, among other things, uh, uh, Hara, um, by Becca Blood, uh, uh, Hara, um, uh, Stephen Wu, and Jubaziani, um, is uh, what if the decision rule isn't, isn't fully transparent? What if the decision maker hasn't come around to the idea of actually making it transparent, but instead a bunch of different groups of individuals just tell each other about the what they know about the decision rule and what happens if only some groups of these people talk to each other? And so they develop different ideas of how the decision rule works and like what are the dynamics around that? There are many, many more things like this that are interesting directions, and I strongly encourage you, whether you're a computer scientist or a non-computer scientist, to take a look at the, some of this literature and see if you can find a new aspect of it, because I really think there's so much there. Um, uh, let's observe a general trend, though. There are kind of these three ideas here, transparency, accuracy, and individual utility, and it kind of seems like we have to pick two so far. You can either be transparent and accurate, but then we've seen that you kind of screw over individuals. You can be transparent and uh, ensure individual utility, but you're probably going to have to give up on accuracy and not use machine learning in the first place. Um, and you can be accurate and maximize individual utility, but sometimes that's going to require you to be non-transparent. Um, and so this kind of leads us to a question of like, what can we do? Are we just, are we screwed? Do we have to choose between these things? And there are some exciting prospects that we might not, um, that we might have a way through. And that's what we'll talk about in the third section, what Ben will talk about. Um, and now I'll leave it open to any questions you guys have. Thank you, Yo. Um, while people think about questions to pose in the slide, maybe we can go back to the one or two left from the, the previous section, and you know, any of us can address them, I guess. Um, so Ed asked, uh, when introducing ML models in complex adaptive systems, isn't this phenomenon, I get the phenomenon of strategic prediction, presumably, unavoidable in almost all instances? Doesn't this necessitate an adoption framework that revisits the system periodically and tests for the presence of such manipulation and allows us to adjust the model? Yes. Definitely. Um, and any time that anybody doesn't do this, you should probably point out to them that they are probably missing something. And that certainly, even if they don't see it the, the week or two after deploying the model, they will see it a year or two later. Um, uh, and, and yeah, I, but I do think that we will have much more to say about the ways that people can over time change their model in, in the next section. I mean, there's also something else here, like, in the standard, or not the standard, the kind of like the ideal setting where a change occurs at every time step, basically the decision rule gets affected at every time step. This is exactly what the framework uh, with the unknown utility that I talked about does in an idealized world, okay? So they take the perspective of, in technical words, online learning, which says that at every time step T, uh, the learner deploys a different uh, classifier. And this classifier is informed by the uh, strategic behavior of the agents in the previous rounds. Uh, yet we still see similar results. So this means that this cannot be the medicine that solves everything. Uh, in some cases, it is the medicine and it solves. It helps us solve, solve our problems, but not always. question, but uh, a great example from uh, Lewis, who says, not a study, um, but in the hiring space is now regularly advised by recruiters to add invisible text on their resumes to game resume parsers. So yeah, that's, I mean, that's a perfect example of, of, of like kind of a, a purely gaming uh, example of strategic prediction, where if you're adding, you know, maybe you're incentivized to have, um, more accomplishments or, uh, on your resume. And one way to do that is to actually get the accomplishments. The other way is to invisibly include them in text so that a parser will see them. Um, okay, we have another question from uh, Jeffrey who asked, is there any work on the impact of institutions attempting to infer protected characteristics? 
how does this impact recourse or equitable access to recourse? That's an interesting question. Um, there's certainly work on people trying to infer this despite not collecting it. Um, I recently saw a good paper um, that uh, that looks at how can you try and achieve fairness when you only collect noisy labels. Um, but in terms of how this affects recourse, I guess maybe what you're thinking of is like, if people try and hide their their protected uh, attributes, then does this potentially cause some sort of, or, or, or maybe like lie about the protected attributes? Does this cause a weird sort of incentivization thing where um, somehow people are incentivized to report something and then that changes the overall equilibrium? That's an interesting question that I don't know that I've heard anyone explore. Um, it, in some sense, it makes you think that like uh, there's a there's a, a canonical disclaimer right at the beginning of every kind of like hiring application and things like things like that, which says that we will not use your demographic information for anything. Um, and in some sense, like that guarantee is important to kind of get the incentive incentives right on an individual level. Um, certainly, for the literature that is thinking about utilizing. Um, uh, 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 group attributes um, as part of the actual decision mechanism, this question of strategic adapt adaptation and misreporting is, is a real one. I haven't, I haven't heard of, of sort of any analyses that address this. Those are all great questions. Um, I think these are all the questions we have now. So um, people can Continue to think of questions and post them, but maybe this will be an opportunity for a five minute break uh, before my portion of the slides, which will start at 4.30 or 4.30 Eastern time, I guess, uh, 9.30 um, UTC.
Okay, excellent. Welcome, welcome back. Getting here. Um, so yeah, great questions for a lot of great questions from everyone here, and we're looking forward to, to seeing more. Uh, we'll have a Q and A at the end, which will respond be responding to questions about all parts of our of our tutorial. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, the causal perspective on strategic prediction, and you're going to see what this means uh, soon enough. Um, so what have we covered so far? So Hara introduced strategic decision-making and the concept of strategic prediction. And she described who the main actors are, the institution who is making the predictions, the individuals um, about whom things are being predicted, and society who we may have uh, preferences about what sort of uh, things are allowed and not allowed or encouraged or not encouraged. And she presented this very accuracy-focused robustness perspective um, which is the idea that the institution is trying to think, how can I maintain, uh, how can my accuracy be robust in the face of strategic manipulations? And then Yo uh, talked about how strategy aware predictors affect um, individuals um, more from their perspective, like how can they gain recourse and how can this recourse be equitable and how do we avoid make forcing individuals to pay large costs in order to strategize well. And uh, as I said, I'm gonna be talking about a causal perspective that allows us to go beyond uh, this robustness framework that Hara talked about. And we'll see that the, 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 the number of objectives for all of our different stakeholders really prol proliferates when we think about strategic prediction uh, carefully. And at the end, we'll dis uh, I'll discuss a broader framework uh, that's sort of new that's called performative prediction and that generalizes strategic prediction to even more cases. So let's begin um, with a sort of caricature of what an institution may be thinking when they're faced with the strategic prediction scenario. They might say that if my model isn't completely secret and opaque, then individuals will game it by manipulating their features. This makes my job harder. Maybe I want to design a resume parser that estimates how good someone will be at their, at their job. And um, now I have to worry about people putting in visible text. This is really just a hassle. Um, it's purely negative. Um, but what I'd like to do is question this take that gaming, that strategic responses are purely negative for the institution and uh, try to go beyond that to a more comprehensive framework. Um, so in particular, let's look at, at this example. So I have here a graphic that I found on a random website. There are many of these on the internet that, that tells you various different ways uh, you can increase your credit score by taking strategic actions in response to the classifier. Now we know how to do this because uh, the credit uh, bureaus have, um, credit scoring uh, agencies have released at least some information about how their scoring rules work partially in response to regulations. Um, so, I mean, let's look at these uh, examples of strategizing. Maybe you can think to yourself, how many of these really count as pure like gaming that's not really affecting anyone's true credit worthiness? Um, so maybe, I mean, down here we have um, this uh, uh, suggestion to keep your unused credit cards open. Now, if, if, if I decide, I, I see this and I said, oh, I'm gonna keep a bunch of unused credit cards open, then clearly this is probably not gonna actually affect my, my ability to repay loans in the future. So maybe this counts as gaming, this traditional sense. Um, but now let's look at this other um, possibility, which is that I'm looking to pay, that I pay back all my debts um, in order to boost my credit score. Well, if I'm doing that, if I pay back my debts, then maybe this actually um, gives me the ability to pay back uh, future loans um, and thereby uh, giving me the, an actual chain, an actual boost to my credit score. Hold on, I think this has gone off full screen for a sec. There we go. Um, so in some sense, there, what I have here is an arrow. I mean, this is meant to be a causal arrow. There is a, when I pay back all my debts, I thereby gain the ability, uh, uh, an increased ability in the future to pay back future loans because I have less debts to begin with. And thereby, and therefore, because this is incentivized by the credit scoring system, 
um, my credit, my sort of true credit worthiness might actually be increasing when I, when I game this. So maybe we shouldn't really call it gaming anymore. Um, here is a more complete causal diagram of what's going on. So let me explain this. Um, we're going to use the example now of college admissions. So, uh, so there's a college um, who's deciding whether to admit various students or the individuals um, by taking into account various features. You know, maybe for some reason uh, they're using the number of books that the student owns as one of the features, although that's you know, sort of a cartoon example. And what they're trying to predict is what the student's college GPA will be. And they want to admit students will have higher college GPAs, even though these are currently high school students. Um, so there's some, you know, some true label, which is we can't even measure right now. We can only measure it in the future, which is what the, the GPA will eventually be. Um, so the institution develops a model and they're gonna make a prediction about what the GPA. And this prediction is going to depend on the parameters of the model and it will also depend on the student's features. For example, perhaps it will depend on the number of books they have. So this is why we have these two causal arrows here. The model affects the prediction and the features also affect the prediction. Um, so far, there's nothing strategic about this diagram. Um, now let's add another arrow. And this is where, I, where it becomes strategic prediction. So suppose that now the students you know, they know that they, they, they have access to the model somehow, or they, they have some guesses about it. And they think that the model is uh, using the number of books they own and therefore they buy more books. And so now we have a causal connection from the model using number of books uh, to the actual number of books the person has, which is a feature. So there's a, uh, the, the model affects the features. And this is what we really mean by strategic prediction. But there's, there's actually another arrow that I want to add here. And I think this is very crucial. Um, let's consider what happens if the features can actually affect the true label. This is sort of what, I, what we were getting at in the previous slide and talking about how paying off your debts may actually affect your future credit worthiness. Or maybe a, an example here is that maybe the college figures out that using number of books is very gameable and they stop using that feature. And instead they use maybe the number of AP classes the student has taken. Maybe this incentivizes students to take more AP classes, which in turn, maybe by taking more AP classes, the student actually becomes better prepared for college and gets eventually a higher GPA. So we actually have a, um, a causal connection uh, that the features are actually, that the taking more AP exams is, uh, classes is actually causing the GPA to change. Now that we have this diagram, it's important to note that there's a the we can actually you know walk through the paths here and see that by changing the model, the institution can actually change the true labels or affect the true labels of the individuals, where the features are kind of the intermediate step. So the the college by incentivizing AP classes might actually affect the how what the GPAs are of the students. Um, it admits, um, or even of the students, it doesn't admit. And this is what we mean by um, improvement. So the college can actually incentivize improvement in this example. Um, so there's there's a, another way of framing this is as a question of causation versus correlation. So um, in the left here, we have uh, a graph. So on the x-axis is some feature that the college is using to predict GPA. And the y-axis is the eventual resulting GPA of the student. And maybe the college looks at some historical data and they fit a line to it and they start, uh, maybe they decide, okay, now we're going to use this feature to predict um, GPAs. And this is before any strategic response to the college's model. So now suppose the college publishes this model, they really announced they're going to use this feature. Um, now there are actually a variety of different things that can happen, and I'm going to focus on two of them. So first, let's say the feature was the, the number of books. Well, now maybe all the a lot of the students just they move to the right, indicating they're buying more books, but their actual college GPA doesn't change, um, it, or it, it really just is unaffected, and therefore the actual correlation disappears. Um, 
in a sense, by, by uh, adding number of books to their model, the college can actually learn that number of books isn't causative. It's not a causal feature in some real uh, sense. Um, but maybe now when, if they incentivize instead the number of AP classes, the students do increase this feature, moves to the right, but also they have po the, the points move up, indicating that their GPAs are actually increasing as well. And so the, maybe the model actually remains accurate. And of course, there are a variety of things that can happen in between these two scenarios. Maybe there's some uh, of what we would call gaming and some of what we would call um, improvement, a mix of the two. So there's actually uh, this paper from this past year uh, by Miller, Millie, and Hart called Strategic Classifications, Causal Modeling in Disguise that makes this point that um, that you know that uh, different features can be causal or they can be non-causal, and we can actually make a sort of technical distinction between gaming and improvement, both of which are examples of strategic manipulation in response to classifiers. And we have to really be aware of the of the causal situation if we want to really make uh, if institutions want to make classifiers that are effective. So you can even you know, you can even imagine an institution not just caring about accuracy. I mean, this is very realistic. The institution might want to actually encourage improvement. Um, they might want to design, you know, it's a kind of a mechanism design challenge. The institution might want to design their model such that it encourages improvement, perhaps without encouraging gaming. Um, and this is related to accuracy, but it's really a different goal. Um, you can, it's, it's a kind of, it's more of a, a mechanism design challenge uh, than just a pure machine learning challenge. And this, and note that if there was no strategizing going on, then there would by definition be no improvement. So the presence of strategic manipulation can actually be a benefit. Uh, it can be, it can be good from the institution's perspective in some ways such as this. So there's a, a great paper by uh, Kleinberg and Raghavan that discusses like how do you how can an institution uh, design a model to uh, incentivize certain forms of effort. This was in UC 2019 um, that really started this line of work in the computer science community. Um, and I already mentioned the Miller Millie Hart paper. Um, there was an, this just this past year a few new papers came out about um, how to incentivize uh, these. Uh, improvement in linear settings. Um, Hart Lab in more like a Lucier Wong from last year in IJCA, and um, a paper by Yo and myself and Brian Axelrod from ICML. And I'll just make a note here that there are very interesting connections from um, this mechanism design challenge to things that have been studied in economics, in particular information economics, uh, where they look at principal agent models, where there's a, a principal or institution who doesn't, who is who wants the agent to perform certain actions, um, but doesn't have perfect access to the actions the agent is taking or to the features that the agent has. Um, now in particular, uh, these two most recent papers um, discuss um, a few ideas about how you might, how the institution might learn about some of the causal structure of how the features are affecting the labels and how the model affects the features. So one way to do this um, is to randomize some uh, the model to some extent, or to just try and run, run experiments where you just incentivize one feature um, at a time to see what'll happen, to see uh, how the distribution of features changes. Um, and this has, you know, this can allow the institution to, to actually kind of gain a causal understanding of reality, which they may care about even independently of incentivizing improvement. Um, definitely still a lot of interesting work that could be done on this, uh, on this approach. So when we talk about causal strategic prediction, this is a strategic prediction where there actually can be um, genuine improvement. There are various goals that just the institution might care about. Yeah, we're not even bringing in individuals or society. 
um, all the society, the individuals and society will probably both care about these things. So they might care about accuracy as before, but now that accuracy isn't really just about robustness. You can I'll have accuracy while still um, allowing people to strategize significantly. Um, they might want to incentivize improvement. The institution might want to learn causal in relationships in and of themselves and many more. And you know, once we you know, broaden out and we, we look at the goals that we've discussed from the other parts of our tutorial, um, equitable outcomes and equitable access to recourse and providing recourse as Yo discussed and minimizing the social cost of adaptation, we start to realize that when we consider strategic prediction settings, the number of objectives that we are important to consider are really like are they're really huge in number. There, there are many, many objectives that we could consider optimizing. And maybe you want to optimize both simultaneously. And it's a very um, important question uh, for uh, the stakeholders in these problems, in these settings, to try to decide what do they really care about? And what do we as a society care about? Which goals do we want them to optimize for? So now I'm going to uh, spend a few minutes just discussing this, this generalization of the strategic prediction setting that was introduced by this paper last year by Perdomo, Zernick, Menther, Duner, and Hart and ICML. Um, it's kind of a change in tack from the causal setting. So uh, we'll just, I'll describe if just a few examples um, from their paper. So suppose you are using Google Maps to decide whether to take one road or another road to go, let's say, from your home to your office. And you know, maybe sometimes the maps say that it predicts that one road will be more heavily trafficked, and sometimes maybe the other, the, the first road will be more heavily trafficked. Now that's that's just a prediction setting. Now, if, as is often the case in reality, a large proportion of the population is using Google Maps to figure out which road to travel, then Google's predictions about the traffic will in then affect the traffic patterns themselves. Um, the predictions are influencing the data. And note this is not really the same thing as strategic prediction because I'm not trying to alter my route in order to get a better prediction from Google. I'm just following what they say. Um, and then another example is this uh, interest rate example. So let's say a bank decides whether to um, decide is trying to decide what type of interest rate to offer um, a loan applicant. Um, and maybe they decide to offer them a high interest rate because they think they'll, they're unlike, they're not that likely to repay the loan. Well, by giving a higher interest rate, this may in itself uh, make it such that it's harder for the person to repay the loan, thereby changing uh, the data as well. So this performative prediction uh, setting is a generalization of strategic prediction that studies any case in which predictions can influence the data. Um, now, in any of these performative prediction settings, including strategic prediction, there is often, there's this one simple algorithm that institutions often end up using when they want to be accurate in the face of strategic manipulations, which is what we'll call repeated retraining. It works like this. The institution looks at the historical data, they fit a line to it, now this is their model. They publish the model, and new data comes up that might've sh shifted in response to their model. And so they just fit a line again, and now they have a new model and repeat and repeat and repeat. Um, and it's a very interesting question that's been studied by some of these papers. Um, how well does this simple repeated retraining method work and when can we do better? Um, and it, it turns out that it can sometimes work pretty well and sometimes it can work quite poorly. And this is a very interesting subject of ongoing research. So, you know, to conclude, let's uh, think about some takeaways from our entire tutorial. Um, first of all, the interplay between transparency and accuracy is nuanced. Um, when your model is even partially transparent, there is always the risk of strategic manipulation. But as we've covered, accuracy and transparency can often be achieved simultaneously. The tools are being developed for this to be possible. Um, so, you know, that's not really just a, a simple trade off between one and the other. Secondly, strategic prediction is a very rich subject of study. 
There are many different settings we can consider, many, many, many different objectives for the different stakeholders. And I'm sure more will be developed in the future. Um, and we just really wanted to give this tutorial partially because we want to uh, see what um, fields beyond computer science can, can bring to the table uh, after seeing this work. Um, it's our, we've already seen many contributions from uh, various fields and we're hoping to see even more in the future. Um, so with that, uh, thank you. Just want to show you this uh, page with all the papers we've been citing. I want to note that I think every single one of these papers is from the past five years. This is a really active area of research and we're really excited to see what happens next. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, so uh, we have a ton of great questions. Um, I actually want to encourage the audience to vote on our questions so that we have some sense of which ones we have we should prioritize. Um, so uh, first off, um, uh, Monica Tseng asks, um, how do we create an open dialogue with institutions to update and change their model parameters and weights? For example, how do we induce changes to the FICO scoring system to better represent our current times? That's a very interesting, very important question. Um, I mean, the FICO scoring system right now is kept, uh, the, you know, things are released about it that are required to be released, but a lot, a lot of it is very opaque. And FICO isn't very public about the ways in which it deals with strategic prediction. Uh, I think just because of the nature of the fact that a lot of institutions think transparency is a problem, they're often by default not so willing to engage in open dialogue about how they deal with it. Um, I mean, I really don't have a great answer for, for how the best, what's the best way to accomplish this. I think it's a very important topic. I, I would encourage you to talk to regulators is, is my answer. Um, educate them, get them knowing about these things the rate at which things go from ideas to uh, to law is 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 quite quite astounding, um, especially in Europe, but also in the United States. So you know we have our work cut out for us as, as technologists and, and so as socio technologists. Um, okay, uh, so um, beyond gaming systems, what are your thoughts on addressing behavior that is purposefully meant to be counterintuitive? I can't help but think of GameStop and how this affects trading algorithms, how trading algorithms now need to think about predicting pricing. That's a very, very topical question. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it's a good point. All of the, pretty much all of the papers we've discussed and the approaches we've discussed rely upon the individuals strategizing in order to you know, strategically improve, the, increase their own utilities. If they're just trying to mess with the system, that's a very difficult thing to model. And if you want to be able to handle arbitrary behaviors on the part of individuals, you probably would have to have, um, talk about having predictors that are robust to arbitrary, um, to arbitrary uh, manipulations, not just like purely strategic manipulations. Um, definitely. Can I can so, I just yeah, one one very brief thing? Um, first of all, this. So I actually so that was the point when I understood that the thing that I'm gonna say now. I think I understood what's the difference between strategic prediction and adversarial settings. So if you have an adversarial setting, um, the agent, the individual, is going to take some action that is gonna make the learner uh, feel as bad as possible, like. We actively, we're trying actively to harm the learner. In, uh, uh, in strategic settings, the agent, the, the data provider, is taking actions in order to make themselves feel better. They are selfish actors. Now, in some cases, this makes the, is, this makes the principal look bad, the institution look bad. In some other cases, this helps the principal. But it definitely shifts the perspectives and the benchmarks that you are comparing against. And this is where the different incompatibilities arise from. That was one. The second thing is that in economics, there has been a lot of work in trying to model quote unquote irrationality. Um, now different models for utility, models where uh, you do not assume uh, exact uh, utility maximization, but there are different 
uh, models for what economists think about irrationality. Uh, strictly speaking, so far, we haven't seen any technical works that work with um, these traditional economics models of irrationality in strategic prediction. Uh, and I would personally think that it would be interesting to see uh, what results we can get from these. That was all. Um, okay, so uh, Deborah Morgan asks, uh, I'm interested in how data protection law, perhaps GDPR in the EU, could enable individuals to access inferences drawn about them as personal, uh, as personal data. For example, the utility function inferred. How could this affect strategic prediction? Is there some standard of reasonableness? Um, I, I'm gonna quickly jump in here. I actually think this is a very interesting question. This is exactly why we are, uh, we are doing this tutorial is because we want to encourage folks in the fact audience who have familiarity with these other topics to bring uh, their own perspectives and their own domains um, into, into sort of this question. I will say that one place to look at is um, FICO um, and, and credit scoring in the United States, as well as like auto insurance in the United States already has lots of federal mandates to be transparent in various ways. And they've still found some way to be accurate. And so um, there is precedence for, uh, for institutions figuring out how to do strategic prediction in this way, even when they're forced to reveal things. I think in terms of using the GDPR to, uh, to encourage this sort of ecosystem, I haven't heard any legal arguments. You might wanna look at, um, I believe it's called the, uh, the, 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 is it the ethics of recourse? The Venkata Subramanian recent paper. The, uh, I think it's the ethics of algorithmic recourse. And there are also a couple of papers by, um, by Solon Barocas uh, et al that I think touch on these topics. And do you guys have any more on that? That's great. Thank you. More questions. Okay. Um, so uh, Lewis Baker asks, if a predictor variable can be gamed without increasing overall strategic prediction, i.e. buying books will not increase college GPA, um, should that variable always be removed? For example, keeping multiple credit cards open for a better FICO score. Well, that's such an excellent question. That's, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, I mean, well, empirically, so FICO has uh, still does use the number of un unused credit cards you have open. And maybe there are a few different reasons for that. So first of all, not, you know, this is, it's, a, it's an interesting question because maybe not everybody has the ability or the knowledge to game the, to game the model, even in a way that's just purely gaming. And so if a substantial portion of the population is not adjusting, let's say the number of unused credit cards they have, in response to the model, then it may still have predictive um, ability on those people, which is an interesting case in which the model might be making better predictions on those people who have less ability to 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 create to to achieve recourse. Uh, and very, I mean, that's a very interesting trade-off going on. Um, I don't know whether it's something that we think is good or bad. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, so I think that. Yeah, so. Um... So Yo said that every time that we talk about these topics, 100% uh, chance some lawyer in the 70s has already thought about that. My perspective is that also an economist has also thought about quantifying that. Uh, and so here's what uh, economists um, have been thinking about that. This is why in economics people, at least my interpretation of a non-economist that loves economics, uh, this is why they introduced like costs and cost functions. For example, in the credit score, in the credit score example, uh, the number of credit cards does affect your credit score, uh, but also the more you apply for credit cards, the more you actively harm your credit score. So there's always, I think that people have tried to, in like real life policy making, they've tried to have something that recompensates so that you don't, so that you cannot go too far away. I mean, of course there are examples where uh, even with the limited power that people have, they are able to manipulate and change the, um, the decision rules. But I think that in this presentation, we oversimplified some examples so as to make them more digestible. That's so. All right. I, I think we're, we're just about out of time. Um, 
There, there's one question. Miri Zilka asks if this has applications in the criminal justice domain, and it does. I've spoken to people who, who work in the criminal justice domain, and we've thought about ways in which this applies. Um, you know, to everybody who has questions or thoughts about this um, and wants to hear more or to tell us what they think, please feel free to reach out to us over email. Um, Miri, if you, if you want to hear my example, I'm happy to give it to you. Um, and yeah, yeah, thank you so much for, for attending. Thanks, everyone.